Hi, everyone. Peter Lisiaga here, your host for Starlight Express Alumni Podcast. And in this episode, I get together with Michael Fraley, skate coach of Starlight Express. I have to tell you, he's royalty when it comes to Starlight Express. He's been doing this for such a long time and has contributed so much to uh, to Starlight Express and helping us uh, alumni really understand how to skate the sets of Starlight Express, and especially in the major uh, productions like Germany. <laughs> hey, it's real, it's genuine, and I hope you enjoy it. Take care. Uh, I just want to first thank you so much. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate you for taking the time to come on and meet with me, chat with me, and share with me. It's my pleasure, Peter. I think what you're doing is a fabulous, fabulous thing. Thank you so much. I cannot tell you that uh, uh, I've been... <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been like devouring this and chewing it and just like, it's it, it's in, it's incredible that uh, um, you, you writing this book. And for those of you that are listening to the audio, I'm actually uh, pointing to uh, uh, Michael's book that he wrote, Skating the Starlight Express and... It's there's so many things in here that I never knew, and of course I'm coming from the perspective of, uh, of a you know a Starlight Express performer, an artist on stage, and with all my ups and downs and all the great things that happened to me because of Starlight and on Starlight with my experience all the way to this moment in time speaking to you, there's so much that I did not know that went on to make this happen. This this now. Uh, history in musical theater and so your book really brought to light so many things and I and I'm emotional about it and and so I just want to thank you first of all for for writing this and sharing I know you have probably about another 15 more years <laughs> since you wrote this but uh, um but I want to start off first of all letting share, sharing with some of the people uh, all uh, of us alumni know you and also have to say that i've reached out to the fans and they all know you as well and so <laughs> so i want I, it's, it's I a great a good, bad thing for everybody it's a it's a great thing it's a great thing so i have to i have to be honest with you that uh uh, this interview for with me i'm um I, 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 i'm nervous and i'm excited because uh I never really got a chance to really talk to you. And I'm thinking back, I'd never spent time with you. No, no. And uh, it's it's a good thing because I guess no one saw the need for me to 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 be uh, to to get the experience of of the of the fraley and the carpet skating or anything like that. <laughs> you were spared. You were spared because you well, were already good. Yeah, but let's go back to the beginning. Uh, I just let's go back to the beginning of uh, when you first put skates on. Can you share with everyone just that very quickly? You know, when you when you first ever put skates on. Oh my God, I remember like it was yesterday. Except I'm no longer seven years old. But um, my mother and my father actually met at a roller rink. I didn't know any of this, and they said. Do you want to go roller skating for your birthday? I was turning seven. And uh, I said, yeah, sure. And of course, in my head, all I, re all I knew about roller skating was roller derby. Because every Saturday afternoon, I watched roller derby on television. And I loved it. And um, so I thought I was, I, was uh, I said, will they have sh skates for my size feet? You know, because I'm thinking I'm a kid and I only ever saw adults doing roller derby. And uh, they're like, yeah, sure. So we go and there's this flat floor. And I was like, this is not what I thought at all. So I put my skates on, on the side of the rink. I stand up, I get over there, I go to the rail. I go step out on the floor and the very first, <laughs> bam, right on my butt. The very <laughs> first thing I ever did was fall down. <laughs> Started crying, went back to my mother. She's like, it's all right, it's all right. You'll be fine, take your time. Within an hour, I was zooming around the rink. So that was my first time ever on roller skates in a roller rink. But the very first time I was ever on skates was outdoors on the sidewalk in my neighborhood. And I don't remember, that must have started about two years before that. 
Good. I know in your in your book, you know, there's so much that I learned uh, about you and uh, about you know your experience and your journey, your adventure, Starlight Adventure. And uh, you got to forgive me as we go forward because I'll, I'll probably get a, emotional a lot of times. <laughs> so I've been preparing for this for, since since you said, okay, Peter, yeah, I'll get together with you. <laughs> and, uh, um, but uh, uh, with, um, you're in your book, it really, t it really spoke about, you know, you competing and the level of uh, of skating that you did now share share with everyone some of your competition what you did and what kind of skating did you do i know some of you spoke about it a little bit in your book so everyone i highly recommend right below on this page there's a link to the book yeah i gotta plug it buddy get, get the book you gotta read it so right below on his page right there guys if you're watching on 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 our page it's right below get the link so explain to everyone uh what what kind of uh, competitions did you do? Well, from that moment that I first fell down, a week later I started skating classes in the roller rink. And then after that, I went into competitions, like the same stuff you see on ice skates. Mm -hmm. uh, free skating, dance pairs, pair skating, uh, figures, compulsory figures, all, all those different disciplines on roller skates happen the same as they do on ice. And uh, all as an amateur, obviously. But what I really excelled at and what I won uh, a national title in was compulsory figures. Following in ice, they trace a groove into the floor with the blade. But on rollers, you have to follow a painted line on the, sur on the surface of the floor. Mm. So I did it all. I did free skating. I did pairs with my sister until I couldn't lift her anymore. And we did dance skating, pairs dance. Um, yeah, a bit of speed skating, but I never competed in speed. Wow. Did you do lifts? Uh, were the lifts involved? <laughs> well, that's the problem. I couldn't get my sister over my head. So we had to, you know, I probably stopped that about age nine or 10 because I couldn't. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying she's big. I'm saying she, I'm weak. You're okay. <laughs> I'm sure she appreciates you cl uh, clarifying that. Yeah, sorry, Liz. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to uh, refer a little bit to the book. It was what, what's fascinating is uh, you, you've you've touched every single I think Starlet Express uh, production. Is that right? Well, no, not entirely. Um, I didn't get to go to the first Japan or the second Japan Australia tour. Wow. Um, the first Japan Australia tour, Broadway wouldn't let me out of my contract to go wow. do that, so I sent. The guy that was assisting me at the time. Is that Joey? No, it was um, Randall Whitescarver, one of the stage managers I had yeah. talked to Kate. Randy. And, we know Randy very well, yes. Yeah, 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 because he was... The U.S. tour. He, he, yeah, exactly. So Randy went to the first Japan Australia tour. Um, I did do a workshop when we were on tour in San Francisco with the first tour, I did a workshop. I flew to London, did a week workshop for the second Japan tour. Mm -hmm. But um, those, and I didn't do the mm, non, shall we call it a non-replica production in Mexico City. That was Bobby Love and, and Ricky Mahika. Ricky Mahika. <laughs> but other than that, other than yeah, that. You, yeah. you, you touched that show via them. <laughs> that's how they like that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That, that's funny. I think they had a much better time down there than I would have. Uh, I'll tell you that uh, um, the, uh, the other alumni that do know, I, I really didn't tell people who I, were, I was interviewing or uh, who I interviewed. That's why that one video that I put out the other day, I had to because everyone would say, who are you interviewing? You <laughs> So I had to throw a quick one. I've interviewed other people over the weekend. But uh, uh, so alumni were excited about me interviewing you and the fans. And so I reached out to a couple of fans and uh, ask them, hey, what would you like me to ask Michael Fraley? Because I asked them, hey, did any of you guys read the book? And they said, uh, uh, many of them said yes, because you have it in the journal, you have it translated. I got Marcel to do the translation. He's Austrian, obviously. So there's a little bit of an Austrian flair to the German, 
But uh, yeah, I got Marcel Brown Eyes to do the translation and we put it out in, in German. That's awesome. Very, very smart of you. <laughs> There's a lot of fans that speak German. Yes, for some reason or another, but they, they, they really do appreciate it. And uh, um, I know I asked them, what, if you were to ask Michael a question, what would a question be? And what they said that they had to ask, how did you find out about Starlight Express originally? And so I know some of them that did read, read the book, they know, but some that did not read the book. And of course, I want to encourage everyone to get the book <laughs> because I'm not going to read it to you and uh, I'm not going to have... <laughs> I'm not going to have Michael go through the whole thing, <laughs> but, uh, but let's, share, let's share with them. How did you first uh, uh, get into Starlight Express? That's a great story, too. It's, it's a typical Starlight story. It's one of those things that I think people are brought to Starlight in various different ways, but this is what happened to me. Um, I was teaching skating in a roller rink in Northern California, one of the things I did on a Monday night was I had a session for adult skaters. And um, one of those ladies was probably in her mid, I don't, I don't know how old KV was at the time, but uh, she came up to me at the end of the session one time. She'd been away. I knew she'd gone to London. She came and she said, Michael, I have got something I'm going to show you that's going to change your life. And, you know, when someone says that to you, you're like, yeah, right. You know, you don't really, you don't really believe them. She said, no, I've been in London for a week and I saw five different performances of Starlight Express. I said, Starlight Express, what's that? She said, it's a musical done entirely on roller skates by Andrew Lloyd Webber. And I said, and in my head, I'm thinking, great. I can use it for freestyle routine music for my students. You know, I had no, no other thought to, but that. So we sat there for a good couple of hours and listened to the cast recording over the whole sound system at the rink. And she's describing the characters and how they dance on the skates and they use their toe stops and they've all got pads and elbow pads and co the costumes and everything, right? I was exhausted by the end. I felt like I'd seen the whole show. And five days later, I got a phone call on the afternoon saying, I'm looking for someone to give skating lessons to my husband, Todd, because he's going to go audition for this show that's all done on roller skates. And I said, oh, do you mean Starlight Express? And the lady was shocked. She's like, oh, my God, you know about it? And I said, well, yeah, <laughs> luckily. And um, she said, uh, right, so we scheduled time, and I taught Todd six one-hour lessons and before he went to his audition. And uh, in, around the second lesson, Todd said to me, you know, you're pretty good at this teaching thing. You should, you should I know who the producers are. If they're going to have somebody help us learn to skate on the production, you should put your, you should send them a picture and resume. So I went to KV and I said, what the heck's a picture and resume? You know, so I had, I had a picture taken that was like very 1980s, you know, with the, one leg up and leaning on the knee. <laughs> and she helped me make a resume and we sent it, we made a cover letter and we sent it off to Gatchel and Neufeld, who were the producers, the general managers, correction. And uh, yeah, Todd left on the end of October sometime and um, to go to New York to audition. And uh, the next, like, Two days after that, mm. Vinny Liff called me and said, will you come and audition for the show? We're interested in your letter and um, bring, make sure you bring your knee pads and everything and an up-tempo and a ballad. <laughs> I have no interest in being in the show. I can't believe I said this to Vinny Liff, but I have no interest in being in the show, but I'll be glad to come and audition if you're going to have somebody help them learn to skate. And he said, he, I think it threw him a little bit. And he said, well, come anyway, come anyway. So that's how I got into the show. I auditioned for Arlene and Dion. Not, not Trevor. Well, Trevor might have been there, but I don't think so. I think it was just Arlene, Dion, Ilsa Chalice. Right. Wow. Well, and they, and they initially, 
you were initially called to come audition as a talent. Yeah. That, yeah. That's when I read that, I, I just I just chuckled. That was funny. Can you yeah, and your 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 journey is just incredible. And uh, again, me coming to to you, I was saying, my gosh, why do I ask him? Because then because you've got like all these all, all these memories of you, and you do such a great job in your book, just laying out um, these uh, your story and your journey. And there's so, some things in here that um, that pop out for me from the book if you don't mind if you don't mind no go ahead not at all and uh you um, got the little markers and little posted oh markers. yeah yeah and it's you know there's a lot of things i pointed out and you know, had to go back and go and i i mark up books all my books i mark up you know, I, do the same. I do the same yeah and i and i love it and there were certain things that i i did not know as far as uh um you know, with, with the sh with the show, I just didn't know. And well, the one thing I wanted, I'm going to start with the one, the last thing, and the and the, and the last thing that jumped out for me in the end of the book was, uh, if you don't mind, guys, if you don't mind me uh, reading this, I just want to read this. You know, Starlight is important to tell because of the simple message of inner sense of self and strength contained behind behind its facade as an entertaining musical on roller skates. Now, the one thing that jumps out on me on this was the, you know, the message, simple message of inner strength, uh, in, a, in a sense of strength, self, of self. And this is one thing, this is a theme that came out, it first came out in Stephen Skeel's interview, his first, we spoke about this with the starlight sequence. Now, um, uh, can you expound, expound on that? For me, in writing the book, I think it goes to the cue the, a little bit to what caused me to write the book in the first place. What caused me to write the book, I was sitting in the hallway teaching skating and I was seeing these people, students, year after year after year, surmounting all kinds of fear to get on the skate and get on stage and be able to bring the show to them. And I realized that the journey that Rusty makes in finding his inner strength the starlight in himself is exactly the journey that the actor goes through in going through skate school, learning German in this production, and not in, not so much in others, obviously, that are English language speaking, but that journey is Rusty's journey. And therefore, people who achieve that process, who survive through the process and open in the show, earn the right to tell that story because they've lived it. Wow. And you call, and you call, and I have to say us because I'm, I'm in that, in that, and you call us, it says, uh, you know, and it says thus not only, I go, I'm going a little bit further down, everyone that uh, haven't read the book. <laughs> 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 and uh, um, thus not only are they each the hero of their own story, but the wisdom gleaned from their learning and experiences creates an intensity and passion and in, in, in their nightly telling of the story of Starlight Express. And I have to tell you that everyone that I've interviewed, um, there's been a lot of tears. There's been a lot of laughter, you know, us talking about our, you know, our injuries, our fears, all the, all the Rusties that I've spoken to. Spoke about going into the office saying, I can't do this show. <laughs> and in some cases, in, in, in some of these, my memory, and Gallagher in some of those cases would say, no, no, they all say that you'll be fine. <laughs> but yeah, you're being, it's about April. You should be saying that, you know. Yeah, it's, it's funny because every your name comes up in, in just about every single interview. And uh, and it's in a great way because they call you the master. They call you, you know, you know, you know they call Andrew Lloyd. At least uh, Reva says the Lord, Andrew Lloyd Webber. So he calls him the, you know, as you probably well know. <laughs> but you are, you know, you're the master. So your name comes up a lot. And so uh, seeing us as heroes. So what is it like? I mean, you started from the beginning, seeing all the starlighters, uh, people who have auditioned and come on with these dreams and you've been in the position where you'd have to tell someone who was hired 
and uh, to do a show that they only dreamed of doing, that you had to go back and tell them, I'm sorry, uh, or be part of the decision to, to uh, basically fire them, tell them to go home. So you've seen the whole gamut from people who went from zero to being on that stage. People didn't make it to the stage. So, uh, I mean, what is what are some thoughts that come to you with respect to the Starlighters that uh, those that did not make to say performs that did not make it to the stage? What are some things that jump out for you? That has to be the most difficult part ever. And I, you know, I have been mildly involved in that kind of thing mm -hmm. and the process over the thirty years, thirty some odd years, and. Basically, it's wearing a second hat. It's wearing a different hat from the training hat, from the guy who has to do and think of ways to get the people ready. That's a different hat than somebody who has to step out and say, that's not going to be good enough. Yeah. And, and the, the problem is, for me, mentally, is drawing the line. Because there's always some part of, I just have such a hard time giving up on people. Mm. Wow. You know, you just never know when, you know, you're going to say, no, no more. And then the next day they could have got it. Yeah. And how do you know that's not going to happen? So yeah. it really takes a lot for me to kind of go, you ain't never going to get that. Because I don't believe... I believe talent can be changed. I believe people can change if they work and want to. And that never stops. And so when you have that, when I have that belief as a teacher, where do you draw the line? Because yeah. I, know, I know in the book, you, there's some moments where you talk about, uh, there's one that comes to mind uh, where... Uh, somebody was auditioning and you were looking at them and uh, um, who was it that was giving, uh, I think, uh, Debbie, Debbie, uh, no, Luann. I think story, you and Luann were doing auditions in the U.S. and there was uh, uh, somebody who was auditioning and then you saw one thing and she saw, uh, and your perception of what she saw and then you had, you had some concerns, you had some considerations that were and for me, it's a legitimate considerations because I think that anyone, and this is where you helped me really to see it. I had to step out from being the performer on stage and being, and you know, and being that selfish, egotistical performer that I'm the star. Look at me, um, I'm doing all this stuff to go behind and considering the creative team and the breadth of what you guys had to consider to put this show together. And it came all the way down to that one performer that was part of this, this incredible uh, story that had to be told that um, your consideration of the performer themselves and their safety, which came out when you did some of the filming for the videos uh, and for the races to yeah. one performer. And so for me thinking about all that, so my gosh, there's so much, and me now being a business owner and now being behind the scenes, being producer and all that, the breadth of what needs to be considered. And so uh, um, so there are people's you know, careers that are on, basically you were part of the decision of their careers. And, and uh, if they did get hired and then you had this thought that maybe they were not going to make it through the show and then they end up getting injured and then that's it. That was that was on the hand of the creative team. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's a it's like pulling back from a in a camera in a camera shot. You're in this extreme close up looking at the actor, and then you have to pull back and you see the other actors, the set, the how to get them there, the money that was put into it, the safety. Will it run? I mean, it just keeps going back and back and back and back, doesn't it? But yeah, it is. Yeah. And I remember in the beginning and you said it several times in, in your journey in the book is that uh, you had no idea what you were doing in the very beginning. <laughs> I mean, from the yeah. picture of the resume to to then when you were asked to do, uh, you know, to, you know, like to stay on. For, well, like, you know, when do I get my money? <laughs> yeah. And how then, do I get paid? Yeah. How do you get paid? How does that work out? Do I do I leave this weekend or 
you know, all the way to when you were asked to do the movie with Demi, uh, with uh, uh, what's her, uh, what, who is the yeah. actress? Demi, Demi, uh, Demi Moore. And uh, so uh, your journey, just learning and growing, growing and learning uh, has come. What's your greatest, the greatest thing that you learned now? I mean, gosh, what, 30, what, how many years now for you? 19 January 1st 1987 87 so so do you still consider yourself someone that does not know or <laughs> yeah there's a lot I don't know the older I get the more I realize I don't know anything yeah yeah but you've learned 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 a lot sometimes I feel like I'm finally getting to the age when I when I met my master teacher I thought and on, in skating, I thought he has he has forgotten more than I'll ever learn about skating. Yeah, yeah, that was great. That was great. Yeah, that's yeah I feel I'm getting closer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, but that's incredible. So, uh, yeah, you mentioned that's Ray. His name is Ray, right? Ray, yeah. Ray. Ray. What's his What's his last name? How H O U G H. Did you Did you ever uh, actually put that book out? No. So, so it's 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 still in your archives. It is. Oh, I'm looking at with his corrections on it. With his corrections on it, that's awesome. That, that's excellent. And so now you're you're still in, uh, at Starlight in Volcom. You've got you've seen all the improvements and the changes and the up updates over the decades, and uh, <clears throat> uh, you've uh, and something in the book that helped me understand also the whys of that. I was talking to uh, um, uh, who was it? I think it was not Georgina. Oh, Tracy, Tracy, Tracy Hayworth. Tracy. And, yeah, she, I I met her when I did one of the changeovers where you you t took the U.S. production and wanted the German production and it looked like the U.S. The, for the U.S. production, and she had she says that that they were doing rehearsing a new show during the day and uh, and then doing the old show at night. And uh, absolute nightmare. Yeah, and so, but in your book, and she said she hated us for that, but she, but it worked. But she said she said, we we just resented you guys for that. But she laughs and she was just great about it. But uh, that reminded me, in your book, reminded me the reasoning for that, and the ups and downs of Starlight, things that I hadn't considered yeah, as far as, you know, um, the fans and then selling the tickets and the financial uh, um, considerations that I never considered. Longevity. The, yeah. And here we are 30, 30 what, thir going on 32? 30, we're in 31 now. In 31. 31. And so reflecting back, uh, the changes have come for very great reasons. Yeah. And I'm happy. I know some of the fans are uh, – some of the older fans are asking uh, why they, they're looking back on it and then why, but I know the reason why, because we have new generations in it. And I think you mentioned in your book that is such a simple story. Yes. But it can be told for many generations as long as we keep it uh, current and relevant to them. Exactly. And exactly. You, the, the world moves on. The generations, new generations come. And I think you probably mentioned this in uh, before, and that is we have people doing Starlight now that weren't even alive when the first productions were done. And the world changes. It's A, a good example is in 2000 when we were updating the races, or the, they were going to do Starlight 2000 in London. This actually kind of never came to pass, but... I stole some of the stole. I took, I borrowed, I used the stuff from the meeting. We had this big meeting with all the high creatives, Trevor and Arlene and Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber's house in London and, and John Napier and all the, all the people, the big people were there. And they were discussing what to do with the show and to make it, to bring it, to update it. Because it's, and I say this in the book, it's a simple story. It's a simple, very simple story. And it's exactly what you just said. You have to bring it to the audience. You have to make them feel involved with it. They have to relate to it. And we had, you know, Trevor said the best thing. He said, 
either that or I'm just convoluting my my his message basically was the races need to be violent. And I realized he was absolutely right because we've got kids playing video games that were 10 times more violent than the races they were watching. And if the races aren't violent, you don't care about Rusty going into one. You're like, ah, oh, yeah, he'll be fine. <laughs> well, that that doesn't help tell the story, you know, so yeah. yeah and it's great. And I think that's why it always has to change. Absolutely. And I think that it's a, something that I see even with my own business. And then uh, I think that's why Starlight is lasting so long because it's listening to, it's looking, it's, it's got the finger on the pulse of what's going on in the culture and it's, and it's telling the story within the context of that. And Arlene is a master at that. She has her finger on the pulse of what is happening. And she, in those, what I call the middle years, has been very instrumental in keeping that show alive until this latest set of changes when Andrew came in and they all worked on it together again. But yeah, very well, I, I know I haven't seen the current changes. I know I've seen the mega mix with Reva, which was in, talk about a, a full circle of, a, of, of an adventure, you know, from being Pearl. Oh, I know. To Isn't now being. Yes. Mama McCoy. Isn't that fantastic? It is so wonderful to have Reva back. Well, she's never been here, but back in the show and involved again. It's just, I went to her about two months ago. I said, I am so glad you're here doing this. Yeah, and my, and she, uh, from what I got from her, she is so, she, she's acting like a kid <laughs> you know, uh, in, a, in her own playground. And I saw her in a mega mix, and Renee and I watched her do her little dance. I was like, look at go, Reva. She was just incredible. And so the story is continued to be told. And I interviewed uh, um, Georgina Hagen. Is it Hagen or Hagen? I say Hagen, but, you know. Yes, Renee and I were asking about that. But uh, she, her enthusiasm and her excitement, and she, her dad, of course, Peter, and the great story about Peter in the book, which happens to be one of the favorite stories of those fans that read the book. <laughs> Peter on tour. Yeah, and that 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 adventure and that story and that uh, when you tell it, it's it's it, it it's uh, it's great. But Georgina, being you know so young, and having done the twenty fifth. Uh, anniversary and the 30th anniversary and so the fans had sent me a cost her in the um previous costume and in the new costume and so so how so how for you i think you're enjoying it right you, you're loving the changes and because you're <laughs> i'm going to give you my honest opinion about these changes i think it's very i love them because it brings the show, I said to Richard Stilgo, I went to see the workshop that they did in September of 2000 and to whatever it was. And I said to Richard at the interval, or no, at the end, I said, that is such a cute story. That is such a cute story. And the workshop was done not on skates, you know. So when you really boil it down, it's an adorable story to tell. And it's so heartwarming and um that's what I think of the changes. It really brings it back to the heart of what Starlight made Starlight in the beginning so popular and really keeps it alive. Yes, we need the trappings. We need the spectacle. We need the lighting. We need the sound. We need the skates. We need, yes, we need all that to bring it to the audience and immerse them in it. But its heart is this nice, simple, heartwarming story. I remember um, uh, on the on the U.S. tour, and I was just uh, hanging out with uh, Sean uh, with Sean McDermott, and uh, um, he was. We were talking about the song. It was it was during rehearsals in New York, <clears throat> and uh, we for some reason or another he had just made this. I, for, I forgot what we were specifically talking about, but he says that you know uh, one of his notes for singing the song was just to sing it, keep it simple, 
because it's a simple story. But that's the power is that, yes, you got the spectacle, but the power, because when you, I remember when you, someone said, when you strip away all the spectacle, what's the heart? Where's the heart? And you got to keep the heart. And so uh, that's, I think that's what I, uh, another thing I got out of your book was that mindset, that idea that yes, let's have the spectacle, let's have the, the violence, the aggression, you know, because that's, you know, you have to have, you know, the, the underdog has to have, you know, the pain and the disruption of life and the, the violence that they has to go through. And he has to rise up to be violent, to overcome that. But then when you take all that away, there's a heart. Yes. And this, this you can, if you read any books by Joseph Campbell about mythology, this is a classic mythical structure. Yeah. And it's vital. The world is violent. The world is tough. The world is, yuck, you know, and it's the mother who nur teaches, who nurtures the child to a certain age. And then the father comes and says, now, listen, that's all wonderful. But this is how the real world works. And it's violent. And you're going to cut you. You know, and then you get all the cutting ceremonies, the tribal cutting ceremonies, the bleeding. All these were ceremonies, rituals to teach the child what the real world was like. Mm -hmm. Out after, and you know, after the nurturing world of the motherhood and child, the mother's influence in childhood. And uh, so, yeah, you've got to have both. You've got to have the violence that represents the world, yeah. the hero, but the real thing is the nurturing and the what's inside. Yeah, that's awesome. I think that's why the story is so pow so powerful. And of course, of course, in hindsight, and one of the things that um, you know, I, I've been saying, I find myself saying a lot is, if I knew the impact of this show when I was doing the show, I would have paid a lot more attention. <laughs> <laughs> Peter, that makes two of us. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. And uh, uh, so now I'm paying a lot of attention. And so thank you for writing this book. So uh, for um, for you, what's the most, the easiest, right now you, you uh, like for me as a martial artist, which is what I do full time now, I've been doing it for 40, um, 49 years. Wow. And, and so uh, so there's you know, what, what I didn't know, now I know. And once I knew what I didn't know, I built on it and I grew. Mm -hmm. And so now I know it, I grew with it, and I flow with it. I'm now in my flow. And so uh, I have an incredible appreciation. I know I have a lot of uh, – there are things that I don't know that I don't know yet. <laughs> about, But there's enough that I know that I have a flow. And I believe you are in where – you know there's stuff that you don't know yet, and you don't know about that yet, but you know enough to know that you're in a nice flow. Yeah. So what are some things that you do now that you get that real sense that I'm in the flow, I can do this. I can get up, I do bam, 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 bam. There's thought in it, but there's a flow that I have thoughtful flow and it just happens. I would say, well, I don't know. I, I don't know how I'm going to answer this question. Um, I'm in the flow in teaching skate school for sure because i could read what the i i in starting in 2010 when graham harvey became my assistant here in germany he insisted on writing down what we taught every day before 2010 i never wrote anything down that i taught i had no lesson plan the whole thing was right up here and just was very intuitive right Yes, there were show-related things we taught, and I always managed to include them, of course. But then we started really writing it down. Now that was a lot. <laughs> that was a lot of release of stress to write that down because I could look, I could go into the day, and instead of going, "What the heck am I going to do with everybody today?" I would go, "Okay, I'm going to do this today." But there's still that part that has to read the room. There's still that part that has to go. No, they need more of this. No, they need more of that. And that is when I'm in the flow because I have this immense, this is going to sound slightly arrogant. I don't mean it that way. This immense tool bag of tools at my disposal gathered from 30 years of doing this that I can pick out and say, we need to do this. You know what we need to do. And when I know I'm in it, 
is when I wake up in the morning and go, we need to do this. We need to do this today. We need to do that. Then I'm, then I know I'm focused. Wow. Wow. That's, that's great. It's, again, it's, it's a, a ma that's mastery. So for me as a, a master instructor of martial arts, I've been teaching for 20 years now, full time, mm -hmm. uh, which, uh, and gone through thousands, uh, thousands of students. And so, uh, so I'm at that place where we like talking about curriculum, writing everything down. There was a time we did it. Now everything, every week we have a curriculum for 52 weeks for the last. So every time, every week we, uh, I get together with my staff. This is what working on this week. So we know exactly there's that flow. And of course, you know, we have this saying where we're, we're, we're we have flexibility in our rigidity. So we, <laughs> yeah, that's we, perfect. That's exactly the way I would describe it. Yeah. And, it, but what, what also jumps out to me, what was fascinating, uh, you mentioned Graham Harvey. Is his name Graham Harvey? Yeah. And it sounded like you are the Ray to Graham Harvey. Perhaps. <laughs> He's writing down. And You'd have to ask Graham. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. That's too funny. But uh, so thanks for answer answering that question. That's great. So now the next question is, is that um, because we're always still learning, what's the most challenging thing for you right now? I don't know if I want that admitted in public. Um, I'm teasing. <laughs> <laughs> Expose yourself. <laughs> yeah, one of the one of the constant. Not only am I constantly learning about ways to teach. I'm reading a book called The Practice of Practice: How to Become a Better Musician. Mm. It's an awesome book. Anybody wants to read it if they like books on such things. I'm not planning on coming and becoming a musician, but yeah. the the rules and the the ways of practicing to achieve deliberate practice are brilliant and will always help anyone who's teaching or, or learning. I'm also reading a book called Mastering the Art of Te the Techniques of Teaching, which is about teaching college age children. But my point is always trying to maintain rapport. In many ways, the, the older I get, the more removed I am from the modern culture of the young people the more difficult it is to achieve rapport. And you can rely on having a younger assistant for that to some degree, but you still need to be quite flexible so that you're telling stories that matter. You know, there's nothing worse than when grandma and grandpa teach you, tell you a story in your living room at Thanksgiving dinner or whatever, and you're like, you know, yeah. because it doesn't matter to you as a 12 year old or a 15 year old or whatever, you know, so. Maintaining rapport is the is an important challenge, I think, for me at this stage. Yeah, I think that is for us to pass on the knowledge and the wisdom that we have, that you have, to the next generation. And it goes back to telling of the stories. Idea is the same when we're talking about telling the story of Starlight. It's, it's passing on the knowledge. How do we pass on the knowledge to the next generation so that they'll they'll stop? Well, first of all, we got to get their attention. Then we have. Right. We, and then we have to make them interested enough to say, OK, let me stop for a second and see if there's any relevance here for me. And yeah, it is. And so now, are they speaking my language so that I understand? And that's what I'm learning with as a martial artist. How do I get a three and a half year old get their attention long enough to pass on the knowledge so that they see the value in it to practice in it? So many thoughts pop into my head. First of all, isn't it a lot like the story that we're talking about in Starlight? getting it across to the audience. Same story, but generationally, we're changing it to have increased rapport with the audience, a new audience, number one. Number two, yeah, I think back to when I was teaching three-year-olds how to skate, I didn't say stroke your left leg and put it down here and do, I said skate pretty, skate pretty, because that was an encapsulating phrase that they understood. They automatically stand up taller, the head is up, you know, whatever it takes, but that's what worked. So yeah, it's about who you're talking to, who's your audience. Absolutely, and, I, and I'll share that with the speakers when I when I talk to other uh, people who are speaking. 
So you have to know, like right now working with someone and getting their presentation ready for this Saturday, I helped them put, uh, I, I did the PowerPoint and everything like that. And they were getting so stuck in the perfection of it. It was about 50 slides with videos and everything flying in. And they were getting so, what, what this word, that word, I said, you got, you have to remember that they're there to see you and you know your audience, who are you speaking to? And they, she told me, and then I says, well, then remember they're there to see you. This is just a tool. Don't lose the heart of what you're telling. And don't forget that. Keep it simple and, and speak to them and, uh, and with them, create that conversation. And that also is another thing that, uh, that, I see with musicals and stars the same thing. You bring the audience in because you, you're you create the story that they become a part of, and I guess that's what they call it, breaking that third wall or that wall where they they become part of the story and they yeah. connect, which is what makes Starlight so powerful because it's that under we're all underdogs, we're all struggling through life, doing the best that we can, and we have our moments. There's the ebbs and flows of life. And so that's the story that's being told. And us as teachers passing on that knowledge is uh, so important for us to continue to let people know this. Well, yeah, there's nothing new under the sun. And everyone says, yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. But but no, for you as well, because they're going through that experience. So with you, with the young performers that are coming in, uh, you mentioned in your book as well, if I understood it right, that because uh, I say that we said this a lot during the other interviews that they are standing on the shoulders that of many that came before them, you know, from the design of the set, from the training of each starlighter to you know, from the choosing of them through the audition process. So much has been learned, you know, and so with what you've uh, with the new starlighters that are coming in, <clears throat> uh, what. Uh, what are you passing on to them beyond the obvious for them? And how are they responding to uh, being in Starlight? Are they aware of the, maybe because uh, um, uh, Reva is there, are they aware of the Starlighters that came before them and the legacy? I've never asked them. I don't know. Um, I know that there's a, you know, there's the youngins. They're into that YouTube, you know, so... They'll look, they'll, they'll scour the internet for anything. You know, some of them have one or two know I wrote a book. That's something I think that was like, wow, great, fab, fabulous. Um, so they kind of do, but I think it's an interesting question because this is what I'm dealing with, uh, especially now with this version of the show, just trying to keep the training fresh as well so that you're not saying let's say let's make up let's make an example say 10 years ago i learned that certain training method leads to this kind of an outcome not a desired outcome to do something a certain way right do i stop when i see someone now start to do it that way do i stop them or do i let them learn it on their own that that may be not work for them you know Coming over the bowl, there's a, as many different people as there are in the world that have come over the bowl, there are ways to come over the bowl. Some successful, some not, right? You can fly over the bowl and land on your face, but at least you went over the bowl. <laughs> but when I see those bad habits start to develop, do I, do I whoop off? Do I stop and say, stop that, you need to do this instead? If you do that too much, though, the training experience for the student becomes negative. It becomes, and they stop trusting themselves naturally. Mm. And there's something about a starlight person that learns by doing, that learns, you know, by feeling it, by going through the process. And I guess it's just about how to squire them through in a, keeping it fresh keeping it creative, letting them think of things I wouldn't have thought of doing because that's how you bring new stuff to the show. But at the same time, learn, keeping an infusion of all that knowledge that we've learned from everybody who's gone before. We learned, you know, oh, it's better if you come over the bowl this way, you're more likely to land on your feet, you know, 
because the number of X starlighters that have come over the bow and fallen in different ways, just as that one, one thing and that one example, we learn from that. Uh, so yeah, we are totally constantly on the shoulders of people who came before us in terms of what they're doing and how they do it. Um, there's some stuff in the show that is still in the show from people who originally did it in 19, you know, yeah. the last century. And everyone's trying to do it, but we still get, and we, we have an example in the show right now, someone who did a spin that we haven't seen before. And that is a valuable thing. It is. Wow, that's, that's well, it's awesome because uh, I know uh, um, in the martial arts world, I had the young people, the stuff that I did when I was younger, that was like, wow. But now what they're doing these days, the young, like my daughter, who's not, is going to be 19 uh, this weekend. She, she's uh, training for fourth degree master. She's, she's one, she, she's one of my uh, highest ranking and best instructors. And her abilities are so great. When, when I was 19, I was not that good. <laughs> You know, I didn't get that good to maybe I got to my 30s. And I guess especially after doing Starlight, because Starlight and doing classical ballet, that helped build my power, my inner core. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, but she is phenomenal. So what do you see from the new Starlighters these days that are just remarkable for you, that are just amazing for you? When I think of the the highlights, the, the people at the, the are really good. Um, they're, they're always the ones that uh, do things with gumption, gusto. They have a really good connection between an image in their head and, and, and just going for it. And I think the, that's, they progress the quickest they do the best in the show. They may not do everything artistically, technically brilliant, but there's a, and the more, the thing is the more, you know, this is the thing about knowledge, knowledge plus experience or application gives you wisdom, right? Yeah. So you got all this information, they take what they like, leave the rest and fly with it in their own and learn by doing. And um, that's still, it's still the starlight way. We're just seeing younger and younger people do it. And they are doing more fabulous things. There's a, I'll tell you a quick story. I'm sorry, I'm really rabbiting on here. Ray went, used to teach in Long Beach, California in 1950s. And um, he used to teach pair skating. And there was a spin where the pair, the pair doing an a, a outer back camel and the boy, the, the lady flips over upside down and the boy spins over the, his leg over the top of her. And uh, he said, it's called the impossible spin. And it's called the impossible because his students made it up and came to him and said, Ray, Ray, we did this spin. This is what we did. Take a look at it. And he's like, no, that's impossible. So that's still happening. Wow. So you, your mind is still getting blown by some. I know. I'll, I'll tell you when I see uh, the video, the recent videos, you know, of what's happening in Germany now with the stuff that the guys are doing, you know, the flips and the, these incredible things. But then, go, of course, I read it in your book. I said, wait a minute. He's been doing this back. And, you know, and then hearing about like the Ricky Mojicas and Paul Ramsey's Trevor Hudges, you know, doing all this stuff. Yeah. And you had people do and, and I never got a really chance to see any of that. But now I saw it in these videos. These guys just flipping, flopping. And I went, I'm like, oh, my God, this is incredible. And so uh, so you see them just growing and growing and growing. There's a difference. There's a difference now in, in my maybe it's my my age. I don't know. Maybe it's the number of people that we've had injured from doing those kinds of things. But we're a little more. um step by step in developing those uh, tricks now. More progressive. In the old days, in the old days, 
especially with Ricky Mujica and all those, and Trevor and all those guys, they just did it. You know, they wanted to do it. They tried it. Like an inline skater would go to a park and just try the front flip, you know, or try the, you know, the, the back, the fakey this, that, and the other thing and land back in the pipe. Um, that's very, very starlight history. And one of the things we started to do with the, in Vegas was we wanted those tricks in the show. But here again, this is one of those big picture things. If you put a trick in the show, you want the trick in the show every night, which means you need a consistency like a gymnast who trains, you know, over and over and over again to do that same move consistently at a high quality so he doesn't get injured. You know, it's like Cirque or any of any of those kinds of things. So we we've really moved in that direction a lot more to be able to replicate that and have it consistent. It's like the tracks boys, the trick skaters on um, inlines, you know, we got to have them there every night. If you adjust the whole stage so that you're, everybody's going, ta-da, and there's no ta-da because he's not there because he fell the night before and hurt himself, that doesn't do anybody any good. So that's, that sounds like a challenge. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Especially if you have that one person that does that one trick and no one else can do it because it's unique to them. And so, yeah, so you try and duplicate it. You know, it's like the same thing with, I mean, we do it all over the place. Reva Rice made up the attitude spin, made up the sit spin, which is, you know, known among the, around the world as the, pent, the, the ultimate one to be and to do. And we had to alter it for other people to be able to come close to doing it. But it's a version, you know, and so you have the original. Some people can come close to that, but nobody really. She'll always be the original. Yes, she will. And she definitely have a, you see her influence. It's funny because I, I uh, interviewed a, a Ray Shell. And wow. Uh, he says when he sees the show, I think he was he was in Germany recently and saw it. He could still hear the little uh, the the influences from way back, just little things. Musically, yes, musically and also little uh, um, characteristics. Yeah, you know, little infle like the dialogue or inflections or moments uh, in bits. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting point because I think we forget sometimes that somebody originated that role. Yeah. Somebody said it a certain way and the director went, that's it. Yeah. And once the director said, that's it, do that every time. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not doing it anymore. Okay, this is what we want every time. And we forget that there was that originating piece of creativity from someone on stage yeah it, who's somebody who actually know in in a sense originated the role and created the character and then the director said okay that's what the character does yes you know it's like a perfect example like when you were saying that you mentioned someone who's there's reva there's also uh um and you let me know anyone else because only i only know the people that i know that i experienced todd leslie with that split you yeah. know yeah with the, and he credits an example. Yeah, he credits Barry from Broadway for that. I find that interesting because Todd had started practicing that when he was in San Francisco. Um, when you when you were working with him, yeah, not wow. not with us, but he used to go to good. This is a good example. He was so passionate about being good on skates for this audition. He used to go and spend time with the skaters in Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, so yeah. I think it was a combination of those two things because he was already working on it, but nobody got it to the reps that he did. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Nobody got it to those reps. Yeah, yeah, that was incredible. So those are moments where you really, you know, people have done it, but it's, uh, but it's uh, when you see someone else do it, you think of Todd Lester when you see someone do that attitude spin, all that, and, and you're and you're familiar with the history of Starlight. Yeah. You credit uh, um, Reva. Yeah. You know certain things, and so 
So yeah. Now I, I was curious because yeah, you. How long ago did you write your book? It was like. I think it's at least ten years, but it took a good five before that to write the darn thing because I only right. worked on it part of the time. Right, and so you, you got to do a part uh, a volume two. <laughs> because what what would you because uh, what would you add? What would you add to the book today? I mean, just some sh short things. I, I don't want you to write the the second volume right now. <laughs> 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 I go I go transpose it and I put it out there. <laughs> right. Um, I don't honestly know. I'd have to sit down and think about what would go in. There have been um, watershed moments, you know, experiences. Um, but I think I basically leave off in that book. The last near the end is the filming of the race sequences for the new UK tour. And I think that's pretty much the last live thing. Mm -hmm. um, it hasn't been, I can't say it's been more of the same. Starlight is never, ever more of the same. So there would be plenty for a second volume. I just don't know what I would. And the other thing, this is gonna, I don't know how this will sound, so I don't really care, but memory is anchored more strongly by emotion by place and by uh, one other thing, clearly not working. <laughs> um, but the emotion of those early years and those experiences for my, that are in the book are, were much stronger than they are now. And so it's hard to remember exact things. I mean, that's why it's called a memoir, because of course, nobody's memory is exactly perfect because it's the same part of the brain that we use to imagine our future with, but so it kind of gets a bit muddled, you know, mm -hmm. but um, it would be hard to say. I'd have to sit down and really think about what kinds of, because there have been lots of changes, all these recent changes, for example, that was one heck of an experience going through that creative process. I mean, we basically, yes, they did a workshop, but we did a recreation of starlight in a very short period of time. And it turned out fab. Wow. Wow. That's great. And so you're still, at, so what's your, uh, right now, because typically I'll ask anyone that interviews, uh, you know, what are your passions these days? What are you doing these days? And uh, what are you working toward? Um, it's actually not that different from the last question you asked me. I'm working toward trying to encapsulate what I've learned in the last 15 years, 10 or 15 years. It's a, it started out as the obvious, maybe I'll write another book. No, I don't want it to be more of the same. I, my, my, my focus and my point of view has uh, matured and, and I was gonna make up a word there, in wisdom. Uh, I've, I've gained more wisdom, right? So my point of view is altered by that. And so whatever it is, um, I'm making notes for that because there's, there's a lot of common lessons that would help others. Outside, so, yeah, outside of Starlight as well, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean. Something that applies outside of this small world that we live in, this bubble, this Starlight bubble. Um, yeah, I think that's important. Yeah. So, as a last uh, last thing you say now, remember, Starlighters alumni are, are, are watching this, and then the fans are watching this. And what would you say to them? I know the fans are, have been phenomenal, and uh, mm -hmm. the alumni that I've spoken to, their hearts, especially those of us that have uh, that now, because I'm going to be 58, I'm going to be 59, and so those of us now that place where, uh, and this this podcast started with the idea of me thinking because I had a conversation with Lathair and uh, but I, when I was training I was thinking to myself um, you know uh, you know what is my daughter going to say about me when I'm gone mm -hmm. I heard your dad about your dad and and so at that moment yeah my dad did so what are you going to say so I started thinking about what am I going to be remembered for and that seems to be you know what a lot of alumni are, are now looking at 
what am I going to be remembered for? What are my memories? What, you know, what did I leave behind that I'll be remembered for? So what would you, what would you like to share with everyone as your last word that you would like to be remembered for? I'm going to answer this in a roundabout way by a quick little story. When I was going to high school, we had to take a history class. And my history teacher was Mr. Fox. And uh, Mr. Fox said, the most important thing in history, history is made by people. Not by dates, not by events, events, but people are the generator of all that, the genesis of that. So his class was learning about the people of history and therefore the events and the dates and the la la la. His tests were a list of names and you had to fill in what they contributed to history. And I would say that Starlight is exactly the same way. The history of Starlight and what I would like to say that I find most important is each individual person and their journey is making the history that we know as Starlight and that it's the people and the focus on the people who are doing the work and contributing at all levels um, are, is the most important thing. You know, Michael, thank you. I really do appreciate you for uh, taking the time and I, I just want to keep on going with you. I had no time frame. I got to be. I got to be at the school to teach at at three thirty. <laughs> so I, I allocated this whole time, uh, my time, because I'm in the U.S. right now. It's uh, 12, 12, 10 p.m. But uh, I just wanted to spend this time, and I just want to dedicate all this time to you because uh, there's so much inside your mind that. Uh, and, you know, I think that myself included, and that's what I want to pass on as a teacher as much as possible. And that's why I like this technology. That's why I love this podcast, because then I have a chance to talk to you guys and, and let you guys um, share and let you share and uh, be on the book. Because I know for a fact that uh, only tw uh, people who purchase the book, only 20 percent will actually read uh, a very small percentage will read 20 percent of the book. Most people won't even read the book. Very little actually go through the book. But I read the whole book. I'm one of the... I can see that, and I'm glad. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, and it's great. But we have the technology where people can hear. They can watch this. This will be audio. This will be video. They can watch this. And eventually, I have people that's going to transcribe it. I have some Germans that are going to transcribe it to them in German. And so... But uh, I just really appreciate you spending this time with me. And I definitely... Would love to connect with you, and your podcast is going to go out. Uh, it's not. It's going to go out like sooner than everyone else because I think it's important that people uh, hear from the creative team and those of you that uh, that helped us get on that stage to tell the story. So, on behalf of uh, just for myself, you know, I just want to, as a performer on Starlight, I just want to say thank you so much for. Um, my wife is scream. My wife Renee is screaming. Me too. <laughs> Yeah, just thank you so much for everything that you've done, that you're doing, that made it possible for us to get on that stage and to be part of this, this history and uh, and um, acutely aware of it now because uh, you know I, I do count my days and I, I want to live to a hundred, and in my journal here, this one I'm writing in my journal, I have right there the number of days I have left. I don't, you can't see that with the light. Oh, there it is. You can't see it with the light, but I have 15,214 days until my 100th birthday. So I do not take that lightly. lightly. And so uh, thank you so much for spending this time with me. I do appreciate it. I am so grateful that you asked me. Thank you very much. And I think what you're doing is a vital teaching tool in getting things out there that wouldn't normally be out there. And they're going to help a lot of people. I think so. So thank you. So let me know if you get to write another book. And can I can I send this to you? And then for you can so you can autograph it, and then you send it back to me. I'll give you. Of course. A, okay, I want, I want to do that. <laughs> Here. <laughs> I'm gonna send it to. I'm gonna send it to you. And uh, um, can you? Uh, I should I just send a care of uh, Starlight Express the theater. 
Send it to me at the Starlight Theater address. It'll get to me. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. I love you. I love what you're doing. And keep it up. And and let everyone there at Starlight let, tell them I, also, I said hello. I will. And, and uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Peter. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.